Prima Media's Mining Weekly is interviewing Henk de Hoop, the new CEO of SFA Oxford, a platinum group metals research organization. Henk, there's a lot of talk these days about the emergence of the hydrogen economy. As the new CEO of SFA Oxford, do you detect any acceleration in the momentum of the hydrogen economy, which was originally seen as being very long term? Yeah, thanks, Martin. Um, absolutely. I, um, I think uh, we're starting to get more and more convinced its time has finally come. And we shouldn't underestimate the, the capital and the broadness of the capital that is now being committed to making it all happen, finally. I guess in the past, um, the, the focus was very much on fuel cells and the future of fuel cells, but it's moved now a lot into the production of electrolyzers and the production of hydrogen from those electrolyzers. And that has become a lot more exciting for particularly the PGM sector, because we need some very critical materials for that to happen. Uh, iridium is one of them, and there's very few places in the world where you find iridium. And South Africa, like with many other minerals, is blessed with very unique resources and will be the key source of iridium. So yes, we, uh, we've seen lots of momentum behind the green hydrogen economy. And, and one can see that in the capital budgets have been committed, the subsidies committed by governments, companies themselves committing money to actually making this happen. So there have been a whole range of exciting announcements, and it's actually quite difficult to keep track of what is happening. And I guess there's been a bit of uh, called headline disruption because of what has happened um, in Russia and gas and fossil fuel access in Europe. But we think it's going to accelerate the, this movement even further. And is it important in your view that the world should be focused on what we call green hydrogen, the green hydrogen economy that makes use of renewables? Yes, but I think also we should be realistic of the size of the challenge. Um, green hydrogen ideally is obviously generated from either hydro, solar, of wind. And the world needs a lot more for many other purposes of green energy. And the hydrogen production from the green energy is one aspect of it. And I think the focus should be more initially on access to hydrogen in the first place, because that moves away the chicken and egg situation. We need hydrogen first before we can actually commit te to technologies. And I think we started to get there. There's, um, there's a lot of commitments being made to see what processes can be run on hydrogen, even in the short term, if it is coming from gray hydrogen, for example. And once we've proven that, that the next stage will be ramping up green hydrogen production to the scales required. I think the big challenge for green hydrogen in the short term is cost. Producing other colors of hydrogen is still a lot cheaper, but the technologies for those hydrogen consumption patterns to emerge are ramping up quite quickly. And I think the volumes of demand will ramp up quite quickly, and that will help in turn again the green hydrogen economy to develop. And which countries are the furthest advanced, you know, when it comes to hydrogen and green hydrogen in particular? We see particularly, obviously, Western Europe having made big commitments, putting real capital in the ground, providing subsidies, um, putting lots of big windmills um, out in the, the Atlantic to make it all happen. Um, I think the reality is, though, as well, that the scale of the challenge is still very large. And I think one of the few call it, uh, focus areas that has helped people to realize what the scale is, is once you get cut off from gas or once you need uh, fossil fuels replacement, you don't fill that gap that quickly with green hydrogen production. It is a long, long road. It's an enormous amount of capital you need to commit, but it's also very exciting. I think um, South Africa has some very strong benefits, um, not only from sitting on a lot of the metals needed for making this happen, but if you look at where you can produce green hydrogen the cheapest, South Africa has a real competitive position in a sense of the density or the intensity of the solar that we have in, in parts of the country. We have space to actually put those um, solar panels up. We have space to put the windmills up and we could actually become a very large hydrogen exporter. Plus, we've been involved in a form of Cecil 
in some of the key technologies that actually can make this happen as well. So I think um, we, we have as South Africa a couple of unique benefits that could see us a leading role in getting the first big green hydrogen projects going. And when it comes to genuineness and really mitigating against climate change, is green hydrogen the only non-fake route? Is this the only genuine route when it comes to genuinely mitigating against climate change? I guess um, it's, it's a very fair question. And, and it's, it's a whole set of uh, measurements. And green hydrogen is only one of them. And I think more and more governments are starting to realize that green hydrogen is there, to, particularly for the hard-to-abate sectors. Um, the quick wins are in battery electric vehicles, for example, and getting your CO2 emissions uh, down. Obviously, a lot of people question it as well. If you fire your electric vehicle with coal-fired power, your net benefit is very slim. In the case of um, green hydrogen, um, you need a solution for, for example, steel production. Um, steel production based on hydrogen-fed technologies can eventually take a lot of carbon out of the system. But it's one of the many uh, weapons we have that need to re- displace carbon over time. But it's not the only one. And what policy blueprints are there out there that look good and are available for a country like South Africa itself to copy? I think uh, it's important, Martin, that we don't forget the speed at which this is happening. The money that's being made available, the projects that are going to be accelerated. And if we bog ourselves down in designing a policy over the next five years, we will have missed the boat. This needs to run at a hell of a pace. I think Namibia has has already shown us uh, their heels. They have started to move ahead ahead of us. Australia has some big plans in very similar call it solar gas characteristics, um, have the space as well. So we just need to make sure we get our act together and start moving fast. That is where I think there is some skepticism out there. Will we be quick enough to make it all happen and get a slice of this, this cake? Because we shouldn't forget as well, the initial phase of green hydrogen will need a lot of subsidy or easy capital access. Green hydrogen initially is not necessarily competitive. It needs lots of scale. It needs consumers. But there's a lot of money available to make the first projects happen. And we need to be in front of that queue. And to what extent will this actually drive ounces of platinum? What sort of projections are there? To what extent you can expect green hydrogen to drive demand for platinum group metals? We see very much the it's at the back end of uh, this decade to, to it's the 2030s the volumes picking up and the the bigger volumes are in the next decade after that. Um, what is also very important is in getting electrolyzers going, PEM electrolyzers in particular. We need a ready, and um, that is where there is a a developing market where we also need to look at. What can we do to release some of the iridium that is currently used for other purposes to make sure it goes in making this uh, hydrogen economy happen? Um, It also is important to be seen as a reliable producer as South Africa of that iridium because we produce essentially 80% of the world's iridium. And um, we shouldn't underestimate the cost of those metals in a PEM electrolyzer. It's also very important to keep a reasonable price out there for PEM electrolyzers to stay competitive. Now, we have enough time for that. It is ramping up, but the exponential curve is right at the back end of 2030 and more moving into the 2040s, which is good because I think also we should not underestimate that battery electric vehicles will in time put some damage into the current PGM demand curves. And uh, it's, it's the right time for then hydrogen to really shine. And to get moderate volumes of iridium and ruthenium, you need large volumes of platinum to be mined. Won't this pull the price down of platinum itself? There's a couple of angles to that uh, that question, Martin. Um, first of all, you would never start a mine for iridium or ruthenium. It is a minor byproduct of the overall suite of metals you produce. And it mainly comes from, from UG2. Now, first of all, um, we have quite a natural, call it um, declining forecast on the supply from South Africa. We have a lot of old mines, deep mines, that towards the end of the decade will come to, to an end. And as a result, we see 
no, not really a risk of overshooting the mark on the platinum supply. We have a history of the last 10 years having produced too much platinum as, as South Africa because the mines kept on producing in a very tough price environment. But that is being consumed over time. And in time, we will think, we're talking particularly the, called the 2030 to 2040s, we'll see proper amount of platinum demand picking up. And platinum is coming out the strongest from all the long-term outlooks from the three metals because of this hydrogen demand eventually and this fuel cell demand eventually starting to require the volumes that the industry needs. So we're not too concerned that we will be producing too much platinum because we need the iridium. I think it goes nicely hand in hand. And do you think iridium constraints could impact on the uptake of proton exchange membrane or PEM electrolyzers, electrolysis, which we need to promote? There's a lot of work being done first in thrifting in the amount of iridium per PEM electrolyzer per kilowatt hour that one needs. And the signals we're getting, there's already good progress being made there, which will free up, obviously, volume for producing more. But what is also important is to look at where the bulk of the iridium now gets used and looking at the other sectors, where can some of the iridium get released? One of the other th- aspects that we've looked into is the current called traditional ICE engines um, industry is consuming some iridium and that will be released as some of the battery electric vehicles start to threaten that long-term demand, releasing some of that iridium again for the, the PEM electrolyzers. So it's going to be a, a tight market, but we don't think it's unmanageable. And then how crucial is the availability of ruthenium for the PEM fuel cells? The the iridium constraint is probably tighter than for the the ruthenium side of things. We also should uh, remember that ruthenium particularly gets used when one in the initial stages starts to consume grey hydrogen, which tends to be a bit, let's call it dirtier than, than green hydrogen. So as more and more green hydrogen gets produced, probably the demand for ruthenium as such gets pushed backwards a bit because we were producing more and more clean hydrogen and the need for ruthenium to go into the PEM fuel cells will start to reduce a bit as well. And what are the other factors that are important to drive home at this stage of the world's fight against climate change? We should not underestimate what's happening out in the rest of the world, the speed at which things are happening. And it's not only in the hydrogen side, it's battery electric vehicles, how governments are preparing themselves to make big investments and call it changing the whole trajectory of the economy in greening up their overall um, economic output. You can see it, for example, in the debate about nuclear. Um, it's changed the tune completely, and it's in a matter of months. So it's the speed at which that happened, and also the speed of change in the, in the whole industry. And I think particularly the PGM industry in South Africa has to raise its flag on how key they are to the future of particularly some of the Western economies, and that we also make sure we keep in the back of our mind. It's very important for us to keep on putting promotional money into those industries to make them happen. This is a, this is a starting industry. It needs continued support. And I think our industry has done a lot of work in there already, but we need to keep up the pace to make sure that these get pulled into real world, economically profitable ventures eventually, because scale eventually will make it all happen. That was Creamer Media's Mining Weekly, speaking to Henk de Hoop, the new CEO of SFA Oxford, the Platinum Group Metals Research Organization.